All right, so we will continue on with our um, class, The Names of God. And tonight we have uh, probably the most famous of, of these names that we're going to look at. Uh, those are just the Hebrew names again. Um, tonight we're going to look at Yahweh Yireh. And you probably have heard it as Jehovah Jireh. <coughs> Excuse me, which is fine. Um, Yahweh Yireh is the original Hebrew Um and, and so if you still say Jehovah Jireh, that's no problem. Um, I know people who I've, I've taught this and they just can't get Jehovah Jireh out of their head. And that's fine. You don't need to um, as long as you know the meaning. So uh, we'll look at, uh, I'm not going to read the entire um, story to you, but we're going to look at the uh, story of Abraham. And uh, 21, uh, sorry, Genesis 22, 19 says, so Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And so this is the mountain where uh, God sent him and said, take your son and sacrifice him on the mountain that I will show you. And so he takes his son. And then um, when his son asks, where's the sacrifice? He says, don't worry, Yahweh Yireh, or our God will provide. And so, of course, he did. And he named that mountain on that mountain, the Lord, uh, sorry, he called that place, the Lord will provide, Yahweh Yireh, and to this day it is said, on the mountain, uh, Lord, it will be provided, or that's the name of the mountain, Yahweh Yireh, um, even to the day of the, the writing of the Genesis. So, Yahweh Yireh, we hear this a lot, and we hear a lot of uh, things along with it, and a lot of people have taken it, I think, um, a little bit out of context. Um, some pastors have taken it, you know, God will give you whatever you ask for and, and God will provide everything that you dream of. And I, I just don't believe that. Um, cause if that were true, I'd be driving a purple Lamborghini, um, instead of a Chrysler. Uh, so, uh, God doesn't give us everything we want, but Yahweh Yire means God will provide. So what exactly does God will provide mean? So we'll look at some things that this means for us. Um, so first, Yahweh Yireh means I am. Again, Yahweh is I am. And then Yireh means provide. So I am provides, or I put the who in there for us for in English. It is I am who provides. It is our God who provides. And so we, we can celebrate, we can honor God, we can, um, we can worship him by remembering that he is the God who provides. So what has he provided? Well, first of all, God has provided a sacrifice for our sins. And you'll notice that that's plural. Sins is plural. Um, I don't know anyone who's only sinned once, except me, of course. Um, I did it once, and I didn't like it, so I decided to never do it again. Um, you are on medication right now, right? Uh, no. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I'll blame that. No, that was a lie. That was a total, total lie. Uh, I have sinned more than once. <laughs> and yes, I am... <laughs> So, well, anything I can say, I'll just blame it on that to, you know, well, it's because I took Tylenol. Uh, I know Tylenol doesn't do that. But anyway, no, uh, the reason I have that pluralized is because uh, sins, God provided for all of our sins. And without going too uh, deep into theology, there is a whole theology of sin. Um, and quite frankly, I don't think we fully all understand sin or what sin is and isn't. Um, I talk to people and they have a lot of different ideas. but um, we have, we have two kinds of sin, uh, that I want to kind of talk about. We have the original sin and then personal sin. Original sin, if you like the theology term is called Adamic or from Adam. And so we're all born into sin because Adam sinned and we have a sinful nature. So basically what that means is every human being has a sinful nature. And I believe that our, our, our natural tendency is to want to, uh, go against authority, go against um, anyone, anyone telling us how to live or how to be. And, and so that's just, that's just human nature. So that's a, a original sin or Adamic sin. But then we have this personal sin and the personal sin are things that I've actually committed. And I was joking when I said, uh, I only sinned once I've sinned, uh, I've sinned a bunch in my life. And, and there are so many things that um, we do that are our choices. And so to me, sin is, is a choice that we make to defy God. Um, it, it's, it's defying what God has asked us to do or instructed us to do or doing what he has told us not to do. And so um, we are 
we have we are born into sin, but then we have the personal choice of sin that we choose to commit. And of course, um, I can break that down further. Uh, which I like to do, into sins of commission or sins that you commit and sins of omission or sins that you omit. Um, I, I've never been one who has been comfortable saying you can sin without knowing it. Uh, there are pastors and movements and, and denominations that say, you know, you sin without even realizing it. Well, uh, to me, you have to know what the the choice is and then choose to de to defy it or disobey it. Uh, so. That to me is kind of, I mean, that's my own personal theology, but um, so there's there's sin of commission. Like if I go out and murder someone, that's an act I committed. Okay, so that's sin. But then there's omission or uh, omitting something. And the Bible says, uh, to him who knows the good he ought to do and does it not, to him it is a sin. And so if God tells you to do something and you don't do it by defying him, that's a sin. So there's sin that you do, and then you can actually not do something and it be a sin if God has told you to do it. For instance, God says, uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And if you don't, uh, then you're sinning because you're defying what God said in the word. So the great news is God provided the sacrifice, just like in the story of Abraham, he provided the ram to take the place of Isaac. Here, God has provided Jesus Christ to take our place and all of this sin can be wiped away. Our original sin can be forgiven, and that's awesome because um, without that, we wouldn't get into heaven, but our personal sins can also be forgiven. And to me, uh, that's exciting because if you get saved and then you have to live perfectly or you're going to go to hell, there would be no one in heaven because I don't think anyone's going to live perfectly. And so if we sin, we come back to God and say, please forgive me, and he says, okay, I forgive you which is in itself a miracle. And so he will continuously forgive. And so he has provided that salvation and he is the source of that salvation. So when I hear Yahweh Yireh or Jehovah Jireh, I think of he's the one who has provided the way for me to get to heaven. He's provided the way for me to become closer to him. And that is absolutely a, an awesome thing. And so not only has he given us that sacrifice, he provides wisdom and guidance. Again, Yahweh Yireh, he is the God who provides, and he provides wisdom and guidance. So God called Abraham to do something that seemed impossible. I can't even imagine if God, I can't even imagine God saying, I want you to take your son and sacrifice him. I don't, I don't think I'd be like, okay. I honestly would probably be like all super spiritual and say, oh, I need to pray about this more, God. Or, you know, if you send an angel to tell me, then maybe I'll, you know, I would find some excuse. But uh, honestly, Abraham knew God. And by the way, he said before, he said, go to the land I will show you. And Abraham just went. And so he, he knows that God will provide and God will give him wisdom and guidance. And so I wonder, has God ever called you to do something that seemed really crazy? Sometimes God calls us to do things that don't even make sense. Uh, sometimes God just, just sends us to places for, for reasons we may not even know, but he will always give us wisdom and guidance. And so God knew what he was doing the whole time that he was working with Abram and Abraham, the same person. Uh, he, he knew the whole time what he was going to do, but Abraham didn't know and Isaac didn't know. And so he's the God who provides. He already has the wisdom and the guidance. And so we just have to wait on him to show that he is the God who provides. And he will do that. So how does God do that for us? Uh, I assume Abraham actually heard God speaking to him. I don't have that luxury or gift. Um, but God does speak to us today through his Holy Spirit. He speaks through the Bible. He speaks through other people. And in the Bible, he spoke often through angels and talking animals and through visions and dreams and all kinds of other things. And so God is a God who can provide, and we can't limit the way he can provide. We can't limit how he might, uh, uh, he might guide us. I, I'm facing a situation that I was praying about, and I just didn't see uh, how it could work out. And actually, uh, uh, my prayer partner called. And he, he spoke to that situation. He didn't know what I was facing, but he said something. 
and he said, you know, I think this is, this is true. And it spoke to that situation and he didn't even know it. And so God provided guidance through him for me. And so God can speak in any number of ways and he will provide wisdom. He will provide guidance. So when you're, when you're questioning what's going to happen, when we wonder, how's this going to work out? Trust that God's going to guide you and trust that God will give you wisdom to, uh, to, to see these things through. So God provides wisdom and guidance, and then God also pro provides provisions. Well, that's what provide really means is provision. Uh, they come from the same word, but what are provisions? Provisions are the things that we need. And remember, we talked in the, the sheep class, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. Well, again, what does that mean? Does that mean I have everything I've ever wanted? No, but what do I need? What do we need to survive? Food? Water, shelter. Um, I personally like uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's a, it's, he did this triangle thing. And basically he says that we need love and we need all these things to be, uh, we need love and safety and, and food and, and it goes up the pyramid so that we can be self-actualized. And I've always, I've always felt like that was true. If you're hungry, you're not worried about what kind of a person you are. You're worried about eating, right? And so mm -hmm. um, we, we, we have to understand that God is providing, but, but is he giving us what we need? Uh, I've often heard people say, God will give you everything you need. So uh, if you have a need, then you're not following God. Well, that, I think that's a little harsh, but God has provided everything we need. But I'm going to take this in a little bit different direction because we are selfish. Again, part of our sinful nature, we think it's all about us getting stuff, right? I want to read a scripture to you. When I was writing this class, God, God showed me this. Uh, it's 2 Corinthians 9, 8 through 11. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. As it is written, he distributed freely. He gave to the poor for his righteousness endures forever. Now the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. Now, I'm saddened by the fact that there are so many uh, pastors and and preachers uh, writing books and claiming that God will give you everything you ever wanted. God will give you everything, and this says it right here. He's going to enrich you in every way. Okay, but why? Jeremy? Yes. Yeah, what, what verse is that again? <clears throat> Say that again. What, what verse is that again? Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 through 11. Thank you. Yes. So... <laughs> Why, why does God provide? And it's right here. God will uh, make every grace overflow so that in every way you have everything you need so you can excel in every good work. Again, he doesn't say, I'll give you everything you've ever desired. And then people often pair this with God will grant you the desires of your heart, which is a gross misinterpretation of that verse, um, taking it out of context. But God gives us these gifts. God gives us what we have so that we can excel in every good work. And so our generosity can overflow. That's why God blesses us. I, I'm, so, I'm so frustrated with America when we, we don't understand that God has blessed us so that we can excel in good works. God hasn't blessed us just so we can say, oh, look how comfortable we've gotten or look how good we are. No, he is, is giving us this so that we can actually um, be doing some good work, doing the work that he's called us to do. So, hey, go Jeremy. Ahead. Yes, sir. The thing that stood out was, was the first, the very first part saying he's able. And, and I always take that as, it's it's not a an immediate carte blanche. Hey, you're going to get this no matter what. Everyone's because um, have you? I don't know if you've ever read um, what's so great what's so great about Christianity uh, and what's so great about America by Dinesh D'Souza. But one of the things he pointed out in poverty, uh, especially in other parts of the world compared to the United States, 
that you know, in poverty for children who are seven, eight, nine years old, they're not able to be educated at times. They're having to work 12 hour days, 13 hour days. Mm -hmm. They don't have any time to just sit and look up into the sky. They don't have any time to really imagine. They've become adults for the most part with nothing to animate them other than just to get their food and go, go to bed and do it all over again the next day. Right. And he was saying the wonderful thing for, Christ, for, for Christianity, and then he pointed out like Mother Teresa and, and other examples who are of uh, people who are going into these areas, said what they're trying to do is create a time for thought, for imagination, for being able to consider why am I here and what am I doing here? And, you know, God is able, but there is still that, what are we, what do we have in our way? Right. What are, and, and especially in Western civilization, what have we, we erected to yeah. make it, to, to put it in our way? Um, so it doesn't, there's no guarantee. Right. Absolutely. For everybody. Right. And we, and we immediately look at it and say, God is providing. So if a child is hungry, but that's not what this is talking about. He's talking about providing so you can do good works. And so, Again, Western thinking, we automatically look at, well, what we have, uh, but you're absolutely right. They don't, they don't think that way. They don't, they don't face that that way because they have a different set of circumstances. And so, uh, and something honestly that I found in those countries, uh, those kids that we consider poor are often very like happy and they don't realize that they're, that they're poor we compare it to us and go, Oh, those poor children, but they don't do that because this is all they know. And uh, that's been one of the most striking revelations I've seen in every country I've been to is the most poor people with nothing still have a happiness that defies most Americans. I mean, we, we struggle to get more, 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 and they're just happy with, you know, as it is. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's a good point. God is able doesn't mean he's going to uh, to do everything the same, but he's able to make every grace overflow. So he can uh, he can give a little, or he can give a lot, or he can give um, as he sees fit. And so uh, he will provide. So that's what that's what provision is to me. Um, God wants us to minister to others. God wants us to spread the news that he is Yahweh Yireh. God wants us to let people know he is the God who can provide, and not just material possessions, but all the things we've talked about, uh, um, spiritual as well. And so he can provide that. And then the fourth thing is, uh, Yahweh Yire is going to provide an eternal home in heaven. And that to me is just, I mean, one of the most exciting things. Um, it's really easy to get caught up in fear of losing everything here until we realize everything there is going to be better. Everything there is, is going to be different, but, but there will be no sadness, no sickness, no, you know, no aches and pains, no, uh, you know, no stress. Hallelujah. Um, I just, I can't wait to find out what that feels like for, <laughs> for a little bit, uh, and, and for eternity, no less. So, um, I'm looking forward to that. And so that is something else that Yahweh Yireh has provided, but we can only know Yahweh Yireh uh, if we accept this gift of salvation and if we commit our lives fully to him. And so we, 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 sometimes we think, oh, well, there's, there's all this good, but you know, we have to, uh, we have to accept God. We have to follow him and we have to listen to him as well. Um, Abraham had to be obedient in order to see. Yeah. Yahweh. And again, uh, let's go back. What did, what did God ask Abraham to do? God said, take your child and sacrifice him like a human sacrifice, like kill him and burn him up. Now that is yeah. difficult, but if you understand the story of Abraham, this is a child that is a gift from God. This is the answer to the promise. God said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to make you, uh, I'm going to make your people as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand on the beach. And, and so this child was the gift. He was the answer. He was the promise revealed. And now God says, kill him. How confusing must that have been for Abraham? 
I mean, I know sometimes God calls us to do things and we're like, wait, what? But really? I mean, you promised me this child and now you want me to kill him? Yes. And so he, and I love what it says. The Bible doesn't say Abraham thought about it. It says he heard God and he went off on his way. And so I don't know if he took time to think about it or what, but, but he had to be obedient and he had to risk giving up the very blessing that God had given him. So if Yahweh is the one who provides, Yahweh Hire is the one who gives us everything. He has the right to ask for it back. He has the right to tell us what to do with it, but he is the one who provides. And of course, as we know, at the end of that story, uh, he goes to kill uh, Isaac, he lays him on the altar, and the angel appears and says, don't do this. God has provided Yahweh Yireh, and he looks, and there's a ram in the bushes caught by his horn. He catches the ram, slaughters the ram, and Isaac is spared, and all, hence all the salvation metaphors. And so all of that was incumbent on him actually surrendering and him actually being obedient to what God said. So if you want to see Yahweh Yireh in your life, you have to be obedient. If you want to see God provide, you have to trust him. I think too many times people want God to provide, but they want to keep living a sinful life or keep living the way they want and then say, okay, God, provide on top of it. That's not how it works. In order to see Yahweh Yireh, we have to be obedient and we have to turn our lives completely over to him. And so that's, uh, that's a look at Yahweh Yireh. Of course, there's so much more there. Um, people write entire books on this and, and sermon series, but um, that is Yahweh Hirei. And so we will continue on with the next one. Uh, we're only going to do two tonight. And the next one is, is a good one too. Uh, Yahweh Raifa. Uh, you may see it as Raifka. Uh, that's with the yor on the end, but uh, it's Rafa, Yahweh Rafa. And so it comes from <clears throat> Exodus 15, I hope I've got Exodus on your on your uh, yeah sheets. Okay, yeah. Good. Uh, I had Genesis on one of them, and it said Genesis twenty two through sixteen, which didn't make a whole lot of sense because um, that just doesn't work. So it is Exodus, but here's what it says: Now Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Mara, because that means bitter in Hebrew. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we supposed to drink? And then Moses cried out to Yahweh, and Yahweh showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There Yahweh issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to Yahweh your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am, or Yahweh, the Lord who heals you. Yahweh Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you. So, again, the water is undrinkable, and he shows him uh, this piece of wood, tells him to throw it in there, and the water becomes cleansed. So, he reminds them, I am the God who heals you. So here he had just done all these plagues against Egypt, but now he's talking about healing, and he's the God who heals. And so uh, that's an awesome story for the Egyptians, but for us as well, we need to understand that it is God who heals. Why is it that we take time before lessons to have prayer? Um, I've, I've wrestled with this a lot, too, because, uh, you know, sometimes we only have an hour or whatever. And, and, and I think, well, we got to get, we got to get all my class in, right? We got to get all my talking in, but I've come to realize my talking is not as important as us talking with God. Anything I can say is secondary to us actually talking to God. And so we can share and we can pray for each other because it is God who heals Yahweh Rapha. It is God who can heal us. So we ask for prayer with each other because God can heal. And we give praises because we've seen God heal. And so uh, we know that he does that, and it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So Yahweh Rapha means I am healer, or uh, I am who heals. And so uh, God tells us that he is the one who brings healing. Again, these aren't, these aren't all names for God, but these are names of his character, things that the, uh, the power that he has. And so he has the power to heal and he has the power to reveal that to us. And so 
Uh, how can this happen? How, how can God heal? Well, first of all, spiritually. We talked about sin. We talked about uh, original sin and personal sin. And, and the thing is, sin is a disease. Sin is the disease that's destroying our world. Look at our world today, and, and it's, it's in utter chaos. Why? Well, because the Democrats and the Republicans, no, don't go there. Well, it's because the, the masks and no masks, no. It's because there is sin in the world. All of this is because of sin. Every bad thing in the world, in fact, God created perfection, and then man, Adam, ruined it by sinning, by challenging that, by, by disobeying. And so uh, only God has the power to heal the disease of sin. Oh, we try so hard to get over it on ourselves, uh, get over it by ourselves. And, and I've known so many people who have tried to overcome things. Um, I, I knew a person that... <laughs> I knew a person that was trying to quit smoking, and so um, he tried uh, the patch. It didn't work. He tried medicine. It didn't work. He tried chewing gum. It didn't work. He tried uh, 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 a therapist. That didn't work. This man actually spent several thousand dollars to go to a, a hypnotist, and he was convinced that this hypnotist would would cure him and so he went to the hypnotist and got hypnotized and man he didn't smoke again for three days <laughs> and then all of a sudden he starts he's like wait what? but but and of course then he wanted to get his money back and the hypnotist said no way um i'm like okay he was trying to find a cure to something that he he couldn't do in himself but if god uh, uh, does it then he can do it Im uh, immediately and so uh, he, he just, and I told him, you just need to come to God and let God take care of it. And God may not work immediately and you may not stop tomorrow, but God will help you. And, um, and so uh, I, I, I didn't actually keep up with him, but uh, I, I wish I had have. but I, I'm pretty sure that he began to uh, slow down and eventually move towards quitting. And I hope he did permanently, but again, it's only God who can heal us spiritually. And so we have all these problems spiritually, and, and it's only God who can heal those. And we, I mean, if you just go in the bookstore, uh, if they still have those, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of a nerd and I love bookstores, but uh, there's an entire section called self-help, and it is packed full of books, how you can heal yourself of everything. Uh, if you want to lose weight, there's books for that. If you want to stop a habit, there's books for that. If you want to learn ways to influence people and make friends and, 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 and climb the ladder, there's books for that. They're all, I mean, there's nothing wrong with those books, by the way, because many of them are Christian based, but the problem is only God can bring that healing. And so if we think that I can just read a book and heal myself spiritually, we can't do that. We need Jesus. We need the blood of Jesus. We need that sacrifice to take our place. And so God is the one who can heal us spiritually. Not only does he heal us spiritually, praise the Lord, he heals us physically. He can touch our bodies and he can take away sickness. I have seen God heal people in ways that defy my understanding. I have seen God heal people uh, uh, almost immediately. I have seen God heal people over time. I have seen God work through doctors, and I have seen God do things that I just can't explain. I have seen God uh, uh, miraculously touch people, and it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing, but God has the power to heal, and God can heal us physically. Now, I want to make it clear, that doesn't mean God's going to heal every single person. I recently talked with somebody who was very upset because a pastor told them that uh, if they had enough faith, they would be healed. And her husband died, and he, this pastor said, well, if he would have had enough faith, then he would have been healed. And I find that ridiculous. I find that utterly ridiculous. Actually, I find that sinful and hurtful because of sin, we're going to die. Every human being is going to face death unless we're here when Jesus comes back. And so uh, not enough faith isn't, isn't necessarily the case. People will still die. And so uh, God has the power, but he doesn't always choose to do it. And so he may heal you. He may not. God has healed me. Uh, I've lost 
track of how many times God has healed me, to be honest. Um, and, and so I have been healed of several things. There are some things that God has not healed me from. And I have an ongoing uh, condition that God has not healed. And that's his choice. I know he has the power to physically heal me tomorrow or right now or at any time. But if he doesn't choose to, then I have to accept that he's the provider, Yahweh Yireh. He will provide the healing when it's time, if it's time. And so we just have to know that he can do it and he, he may choose to do it. So we pray for healing, but we also have to accept that sometimes God says no, or I'm going to heal in a different way. So uh, Yahweh uh, Recha, he can heal spiritually, he can heal physically, he can heal emotionally. Oh my goodness, this one is, is, is important because um, people are damaged. <laughs> uh, I, I often, I've often heard people say this uh, phrase, well, if, you know, I have a lot of baggage. That's a way of saying I've been damaged. So uh, think just real quickly, has anyone ever, has anyone in your life ever said anything hurtful to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We remember it, right? I mean, it doesn't take long. In fact, as soon as I said that, people started nodding. Yeah. How do we know? Because we remember. Because people have heard us. I can go all the way back to second grade or, or third grade. People said mean things to me. I don't know why I can remember them. I just do. And I can go back to two weeks ago, two months ago, two years ago, and I can remember things that people have done to hurt me emotionally. It's going to happen. And, and I tell people, uh, I saw a bumper sticker once that said, life happens. Um, I saw another version of it, but I can't say that one uh, when I'm teaching or preaching. But uh, it, it happens to all of us. It, it happens. I actually put a blank, blank happens. And so I had people like, where is he going to go with this when he fills in the blanks? But anyway, uh, life happens to all of us, but we get emotionally wounded. People are nasty sometimes. People say things. And especially if they're hurting, sometimes people who are hurting will lash out at other people. And, and, and we have to translate. Um, I'm, I'm going to write a book on uh, translating what people are saying because so many times when people lash out at us, they're not even mad at us. They're mad at somebody else who hurt them, and then they're lashing out at us. So we have to know that. But, but God has the power to heal that. God has the power to uh, overcome. I know there have been things that have happened to me, and if you've got you know, six hours, I will tell you my story of the last 20 years. I was emotionally destroyed for a bit. And I was in a really dark place because of what someone else did to me and, and all the things that came with that. And I didn't think that God could heal it. I honestly thought it was too big for God. And he proved time and time again that it's not too big for him. And so he has, has brought healing uh, through that time because he is the God who heals. And so if you have an emotionally damaged uh, um, anything, uh, he, can, he can bring healing to that. Again, not all at once sometimes. Sometimes he does, but he can certainly help us uh, work through that. So he brings, uh, go ahead. Okay, I just thought I'm hearing things. So uh, he can work uh, emotionally and he can bring healing to us that way. And along with that, he could bring healing in our relationships. One of the things Satan likes to do is wreck relationships. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what the number is anymore because I kind of stopped counting, but uh, what's the divorce rate now? Is it like 112%? Um, I mean, it seems like that's what we're moving to because all you hear is, is uh, you know, we're moving higher than 50. I did see that uh, when it crossed over 50%, that actually the divorce rate among Christians was like 67%. And that made me very sad. So um, that's, that's part of the emotional baggage that I, we just talked about. But I also believe God can heal relationships. I also believe that God can work through two people who are willing to work through something with God. He will, uh, he will honor that. And so uh, again, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not saying anything about divorce, actually. I'm not saying uh, uh, do or don't. That's a whole nother lesson. But what I'm saying is God does have the power to heal relationships, just like physically he may heal. He may not. 
uh, he may he may work through one person, but the other person doesn't want to, and there's there's all those dynamics. But I'm saying God has the power to heal relationships. Now, I ask you, has anybody said anything to hurt you? You remember that. So do you still have a relationship with those, that person? Yes. How? Yeah. Forgiveness. <laughs> awesome. See? And so God has brought healing when there's forgiveness and when there's, and there's uh, you know, it's amazing to me because uh, I've said a lot of stupid things in my life. And things that I meant one way and somebody took another way. So I have to apologize a lot. Um, I mean, you've, you've been with me enough to know. Uh, so like sometimes I tell jokes that I think are funny. Other people are like, yeah, no, that's not funny. Um, and and uh, so I have to apologize occasionally. And God can bring healing through that. And so if we have a relationship that that is uh, damaged, know that it is Yahweh Rapha. It is God who can heal that. And so if we bring it to him and we work together, then he can do that. And that's every kind of relationship. That's not just husband and wife. That's best friend. That's father and son. That's, that's uh, every relationship under the sun. And so God can heal them if we allow it. And along with that, in our congregations. There are so many congregations in our country full of people who have been hurt. And, and we talk about this emotional baggage, and there are congregations that have been destroyed because a pastor did something or said something, or because a person in church attacked somebody or attacked the pastor, or, uh, I mean, just so many different things. There are congregations that the relationships have been destroyed. And to me, that's just like a marriage breaking up. God wants his congregations to be places full of forgiveness and love. And, and how are we going to get the world to come in and see God's love if we're fighting with each other? And so we have to have that healing in our congregation. Again, there are congregations that have been split by, by ridiculous things. I, I, oh, I've, I've, I've heard so many stories, but I, I, I read this story. of um, There was a young man who moved down south. And he went to the bus stop every day and he sat at the bus stop and across the bus stop was uh, this church called Left Foot Church, Left Foot Baptist Church. And he just thought, what a ridiculous name for a church, right? Left Foot Baptist. Okay. Well, he sat there every day and, and uh, he'd been there for quite a while and he was really curious. And one day there was a, a, an older gentleman sitting there when he got to the bus stop and he said, hey, do you happen to know what the story is with that church? And the, the man said, yes, I, I do. And let me tell you what it is. He said that church split over a very serious issue. And the man's like, oh, wow, okay, what, what happened? And he said, well, the pastor preached on foot washing. And they began to discuss which foot should be washed first, the right or the left. And several people thought the right should be washed first, but several people thought the left. And they got in such a fight that the left group split off and started their own church and spitefully called it the Left Foot Baptist. Stupid. Hey, Jeremy. Yes, sir. Sounds like they all got off on the wrong foot. They did, indeed. <laughs> they all got off on the wrong foot. And I've, I've been told that's true. I don't know. I haven't verified that, but I've heard that that's actually a true story. And nothing would surprise me about that because church people do that. They we have to worry argue. about their soul. Huh? We have to worry about their soul. Exactly. You, oh, seriously. <laughs> S-O-L-E, their soul. Their, yeah. This is, so we're going to start our church call it Soul Baptist. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, what worries me is that there's that fear of hurting someone without intending to and not even knowing you've done it. Correct. And then how do you move forward from there? Um, Absolutely. I don't think you can until you are made aware of it. Yeah. You know, sometimes God will make us aware of things and, right. and we may go to the person and they just may not accept our apology. I've had that happen. Uh, but if we, you know, if you feel like there's something, you know, uh, and pray about it and say, God, give me peace. God, heal me. Yahweh Rapha, heal me of this. If I need to do something, show me. But otherwise, uh, 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 help me. And 
I don't think like most people, and and that can be good and that can be dangerous, but one of the things I wish is I wish we were just honest with people. Yeah. I really wish we were just honest with people because I live in this world where if you ask me a question, I'll answer you honestly. And I told my wife, don't ask me, do you like this dress? If you just want me to say, oh, it's beautiful. Don't ask me how you're feeling if you don't want to know. That bugs me. People say, oh, how are you? And then they walk away. And I'm like, hey, get back here. You ask me a question. <laughs> yeah, there might be a 20-minute answer, but don't <laughs> ask if you don't want to know. And so I really wish that we lived in, in a world where we could all be adults. And I could say, and I'll do this, um, I don't like what you just said. That upsets me. Because then if the person says, yeah, well, too bad, you're an idiot. Well, I know where I stand. But a lot of times people will say, oh, I didn't mean it that I'm sorry. And a lot of times I've said that, oh, I, that's not how I meant that. I'm sorry. That's how you took that. That to me is a conversation, communication. And so um, I, wish, I wish we lived in that world. But instead, we get hurt. And then we go and we start telling everybody else. And then we start this whole big thing. And that's how these things in congregations get started. Uh, then people start picking sides and it can blow up pretty fast. And so um, my advice on that would be go to, to uh, Yahweh Rapha uh, and say, God, heal me of this. Uh, if there's something I need to do, then let me know. If not, give me peace so I can move on. And I believe God will always, I believe God will always honor that. If there's something you need to do, God will tell you. He'll make sure that you know. Uh, if you. it's just an, an uh, annoying feeling like, oh, I, you know, then that's Satan trying to derail you. Um, and so uh, I, I believe that God will honor uh, when we seek him. So, um, yeah. Well, Psalm, Psalm 139. Um, what is it? Is it 22, 23 or 23, 24, where it says, uh, look into me, God point out what is wrong with me what what i need to what i need to work with my i'm sorry i'm horribly paraphrasing it and then lead me in the path everlasting i mean it's basically say let's go through this see what's wrong with me yep and, yeah. and it's not a bad thing to do an inventory check. absolutely not absolutely yeah. not and and i honestly pray that often god have i done something have i said something uh, because I can't tell you how many times, and actually my wife uh, has been amazing for me for this. I say things that I mean complimentarily <laughs> and they're offensive. And she says, honey, that's not, she knows what I mean. And she's like, that's not how that came out. So she'll tell me how it sounds. And I go, oh no, that's not what I meant. But, but she's helped me learn that I have to make sure that I say things the way people will receive what I mean and not actually what I'm saying. If that makes sense. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Take an inventory, let God search us and, uh, and, and bring that healing to us. So, all right. So that's God, the healer. Our last section here is, whoa, what? it comes with requirements as with God, as with everything, we, we often want stuff, but we don't think about the requirements. And we have to understand there are requirements to know God as the healer. In order to know Yahweh Rapha, we have, to, we have to do some certain things. Number one, we must listen to his word. We have to listen to his word. So when I'm reading the Bible and it says something and it jumps out at me and it speaks to my soul and it says, oh, you didn't do that right or or maybe I'm reading the word and he says, you need to apologize to so-and-so, or you need to not do this anymore, or not say that anymore. We need to listen to that. We need to obey that. We need to heed that call. And uh, we have to listen to it. We have to hear it. We have to obey it. We have to obey his commands. His commands are clear in the Bible. Uh, I mean, they're, they're written down. His calling isn't always quite as clear, but we have to listen when we hear it. We have to accept it, and we have to uh, obey that command and we have to live a holy life and again um that's one of those words that we use and it kind of frustrates me how we use it in church holy it doesn't mean perfect it doesn't mean you're without sin it doesn't mean you are are suddenly mother Teresa. it means that you're set apart that you live a life different than the world of sin or different from the sinful nature that is in us because we've been healed by god so god heals us and then we live differently now that 
if we go back and do something that we shouldn't, or like we were talking about, we say something we wish we wouldn't have, then you apologize because that's what holy life is. You're different. You know, you don't just say, hey, I said it, deal with it. No, we, we say, hey, you know, I'm sorry, and, and we talk through it. So we have to live a holy life. We have to live a life that is uh, uh, set apart from the world. And quite frankly, I fear that a lot of uh, people who call themselves Christians are not living any differently than the world. And, and how, are the world, how is the world going to see that God is different if his people don't show them that? So um, we, we need to live that holy life. We need to make sure that we are exemplifying that life that he has given us and that he has shown us. And how is that possible? I'm going to go all the way back to the very beginning. If you remember the scripture, the water was bitter, right? How did God tell Moses to bring healing? Throw in a log. Take a piece of wood and toss it in the water. Now, that does not make sense, does it? Because I've picked no. up logs and I've thrown them and it doesn't do anything except if it hits somebody or something, it does damage. Why <laughs> on earth would God, the healer, not just heal the water? Because God doesn't do anything by accident. God told Moses, take a piece of a tree and it will bring healing. And all the way in the New Testament, Jesus went to the piece of the tree to bring healing. That piece of lumber that was shaped into a cross brought the ultimate healing to us. All of this that we've talked about is possible because of that piece of wood that Jesus was nailed to. I think, and this is just my opinion, I think that's what God was thinking about when he said, Moses, take a log and throw it in the water and it will be healed. What was bitter was made clean. What was bad was made good. What was unusable was made palatable and usable to bring and restore life. That piece of wood changed everything. That to me is Yahweh Rapha. That is what I think of when I think of my God, the healer, with a piece of wood that Jesus was nailed to. He changed our world and our eternity forever. And that to me is Yahweh Rapha, Yahweh the healer. All right, that is it on this week. We will pick up next week and we will continue on uh, learning some more of the names of God. So thank you very much. And... God bless.